the webinar series, it's about the update of the spine surgery. And our first topic is lumbar fusion surgery indications and techniques. We have very good talkers, very good friends here. And uh, the first talk is from an invasive surgery fusion techniques. You have to give, to give me, I, I cannot, so here we are. Uh, question of uh, how uh, fusion could be done in a minimally invasive way. So uh, basically I would like to go through some uh, just uh, basics about uh, why, why should we consider minimally invasive? There is three uh, papers that uh, have, this is one of them, the scientific basis of minimally invasive spine surgery for the multifidus muscle, and then two others. Those would uh, be the basis to understand why uh, should we consider muscle preservation accesses. So, uh, uh, the idea is to get the post -op comfort. And for me, what's very important is to get much less iatrogenic instability uh, by going uh, uh, through the muscle instead splitting the muscle. And also we know by the rehabilitation people that when you get a, a very nice muscle uh, uh, preservation, you have better coordination and better comfort. So uh, you know that the multifidus muscle is the main uh, muscle that is addressed when you go uh, to the spine. Uh, the uh, longissimus is much less important. And more and more we know we, we can feel the anatomy through, through the muscle even using your fingers. Uh, today we know also that we can access uh, through tubes through endoscopy and we can place implants. So once you get those technology mastered, you can do fusions for one, two, or many levels. I will show you. So the technology today is uh, uh, accessing by, by tubes, uh, placing uh, a disc uh, distractors, uh, and also placing pedicle screws. Uh, and more and more, we have instrumentation that is dedicated to such uh, such uh, surgery. Uh, every industry is is doing percutaneous screws, percutaneous rods, uh, and also you have a, a, a wire-based uh, screws or uh, or one-shot uh, uh, screws without any wire uh, before. Uh, uh, insertion of the rods also is more and more sophisticated. Cages uh, came recently also and could be inserted uh, and expanded through tubes. Uh, the fusion still the, the limitation, how to fuse uh, a segment. Uh, placing implants is easy, but fusion is done either by interbody devices or placing speculums or tubes on the facets and draining those facets. Uh, this is one of the cage, expandable cage that is used by, uh, uh, by Michael Wong in Miami. Also, personally, I don't like to, uh, when, I, when it comes to long contact, I prefer to have a mini open on the sacroiliac joint and place my implant. But my Rick Wong, as you can see here, he, he does it uh, percutaneously. This is uh, the way I place my screws. It's a mini open access, and you can see I place two to three screws uh, in the ilium and sacrum. So uh, I prefer to uh, do a hybrid access, open on the sacrum, and then percutaneous above. Let's go uh, through some examples. I wanna, I wanna make sure that uh, mastering minimal invasive uh, decompression might uh, save some fusion. Look at this patient who comes from uh, uh, abroad for surgery. He was complaining of uh, claudication. And you can see that this deformity is uh, 
is a, an indication for fusion, but I did not fuse this patient because I say his stability by doing minimal invasive decompression. And this is, uh, uh, I'm following this patient for two years of decompression and he had this decompression at three levels. So this is a, a, a one level uh, spondy here. Uh, I want to emphasize also is uh, uh, I go posterior uh, minimally invasively when uh, when patient had a low pelvic incidence and I go anterior first and posterior second if the patient had a large pelvic incidence because I, I, I restore better low doses, better segmental low doses when I go first anterior. Both are minimal invasive access. So again, the, the, the typical minimal invasive fusion is the T lift. I show you how I do mine. Uh, this is a, a, a spondy at L45. Uh, and this is typically uh, a minimal invasive uh, uh, cage, uh, screws, and rod insertion percutaneous. Usually also uh, when patient, as in this situation, had a low pelvic incidence. You can see here, this is a lesion spondia L45. This is his uh, planning, and you see that the pelvic incidence is 54 uh, degrees. Uh, and in this case, I will go uh, uh, typical uh, uh, tiller. So placing the Jamshid needle, then placing the uh, wires, tap, and this is uh, my two screws are placed on, on the opposite side, on the, on the contralateral side of the symptom. And the ipsilateral side of the symptoms, I dilate and place my. Uh, uh, drill, get out the facets and place a distractor in uh, in the in the disc space, and then you I distract, uh, and you can see that the rod and the contractor side is uh, sliding inside the screws. Once I get my uh, distraction, I uh, reduce the spondy. You can see on the op opposite side and take out my distractor. So this is before going in the disc, taking out the disc, shaving the disc, placing my cage, and this is the end of the story. So typically uh, I, this, I place my screws on the contralateral, do my disc work on the ipsilateral, uh, distract, lock my distraction, place my cage and bilateral uh, 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 screws. And this is the end of, of it. Uh, and when it comes to high pelvic incidence, I do uh, 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 all lift first and percutaneous screws second. This is one one of uh, uh, this is a case here. All lift first, placing the screws second. Uh, I I would like to share with you this how important is anterior realignment. This patient had uh, two levels, uh, discopathy and back pain, uh, and a very slight claudication. Uh, I've done his, uh, his angioscity here, and I went anterior with one uh, axis, uh, um, lateral A lift at L5S1 and O lift at L45. And look at the results. This is before. Look, look at, at his profile and the, uh, the legs and the sacrum. This is after. So look, uh, look at the sacrum before and after. So by just realigning anteriorly, we get the antiversion, we reduce the compensatory mechanism of retroversion of his pelvis. So this is before the anterior axis, and this is after. You can see that at the pelvic tilt, the, the retroversion uh, went from uh, uh, retroversion to, uh, uh, to normal version. So deformity, uh, fusing deformity and minimal invasive is also an option. Uh, you can see here a, a case where anterior realignment was done first and posterior uh, fixation second. So you can see here the realigning this patient by 
uh, uh, combined approach. This is also another uh, uh, example here where uh, I went for one step uh, anterior uh, uh, cages and posterior uh, fixation percutaneous. This is also typically uh, a minimal invasive long segment fusion. And recently, I would like to share with you my last uh, acquisition of this technology, so robotics. Uh, and as you can, as you feel everywhere that the, the doctors, surgeons are uh, planning simulating surgery before, before execute, executing the surgery. So uh, uh, we, we got the Maser robot here, and this is the uh, pla planning, uh, planning the surgery first. I would like to share this one. So this patient had two levels uh, OLEF and percutaneous uh, screws uh, uh, robotically assisted uh, in uh, screws are placed by, by robots. I mean, uh, by, by uh, assistance with the robots. And this is uh, the post-op uh, uh, X-rays before and after. So as a conclusion, I think uh, uh, today, minimal invasive access are, uh, are almost the gold standard. It's uh, getting more and more, more and more sophisticated. Uh, I would go often when it comes to uh, I would say rigid deformity, and I need to destroy the spine to to break the sp the spine in order to realign. Um, when when it comes to minimal invasive, we have uh, to consider: is it mono or multi segmental fusion? Is it mobile? And make sure that we are uh, respecting the, the rules of realignment because this is, uh, is is no compromise. You have to respect. Uh, the the alignment, the proper alignment of each patient. Thank you. Sekar, <clears throat> thank you so much. It was really, again, a great presentation. Uh, because, uh, I think because of the uh, connection, we couldn't get the algorithm. If you have low pelvic incidence, you're just doing posteriorly, am I right? And if you have high pelvic incidence, you're doing first from anterior, then you're doing the posterior. Am I right? Yeah, Richard, welcome again. Yeah, I just want to answer you. Yes, yes. If I'm if I have low pelvic incidence, T lift will yeah. work. Did, did you hear me? No, Richard. Oh, I, if you have I think low... the network is not. If I have low pelvic incidence, yes, I go T left. Yeah. If I have uh, a large pelvic incidence, take in a in a in, in a in T left. So I would uh, I prefer to go anterior, restore as much as low doses as I can, and then go percutaneous. Yeah, it's clear now. So another thing that uh, in some cases we have seen that you have used percutaneous iliac screwings. So how uh, could you combine it with the main system, with the main road? Is it, we have some difficulties to connect the iliac screw. Yes. So when, when um, um, if, if you're doing short segments like in metastasis, it's, it's not so difficult. But if you're doing a long segment, I do on, on the ilio, iliac and sacrum, I'll do it mini open. Mm -hmm. On my sacrum, I just open a, a small incision so I can control my rods because as you as you said, it's not easy to bring the rod inside. Yeah. Richard, thank you so much. It was really a great presentation as usual. Do we have any uh, question from the audiences? So Yasser Özgün is asking, Asaker, how upper root for aminotomies is possible for great two listesis through minimal invasive surgery? Uh, uh, how? You can- uh, oh, no, I didn't get the question. Yeah, Richard, you can uh, read it on the right side.
On the, the chat screen. Yeah. I cannot see it. Click on the chat. Chat, 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 chat. No. And it, it, did he write it in English? Yeah. I, I can't see chat, so. So how upper root for aminotomies is possible for grade two listasis through minimal invasive surgery? Can you it's, do? Yeah, uh, yes. you, you can. You can unroof the foramen mm -hmm. by by accessing a minimal invasive. But uh, uh, as we know, sometimes the foramen is so narrow that you need to restore height of the disc. So uh, it, it, this is a strategy. But uh, technically, you can you can open a foramen even with grade two spondy. I do this also sometimes when I'm uh, getting the right uh, the right uh, uh, direction. Thank you so much, Richard. So if we don't have.